Well, as we continue to watch the scenes unfold in Afghanistan and the Taliban forming a government, it's important to acknowledge the Herculean effort of the UK forces who have saved the lives of so many as the Taliban took hold. Operator, Operation Pitting may well go down in history as one of our greatest military rescues, the largest for the RAF for over 70 years, while under the most impossible conditions in Afghanistan. We're joined now by Wing Commander Calvin Bailey and the person you saw in that photograph there, Sergeant Andy Livingstone, inside their aircraft, an A400M, or just outside it, as I can now <laughs> see. Um, it's not that big. Uh, they're um, uh, with us here. I'm going to start with you, Andy, if I may. Um, we saw the picture of you holding the baby. We've been talking about it with the ear defenders you put on. How did that come about? What was going on? It was, there was a mother struggling, wasn't there? How old was the baby at the time? So, uh, we were in the cruise. We'd got out of Kabul, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and the family, the whole family caught my attention. It was mum, dad, um, their three daughters and their, and their son, um, and they all, all, they all looked terrible. Um, by this stage in the operation, these were the people that were at the back of the queue who'd been outside, you know, waiting to get into Kabul Airport the longest, waiting to get rescued the longest, um, and they looked terrible. So it was their eldest daughter that initially um, caught my attention. She was in clear, clearly in shock, really exhausted in a bad, bad way. So um, priority was getting her medical attention. Um, stayed close by throughout the flight to, to the family, making sure they were all right. And out the corner of my eye, at one point, we seen um, something drop to the floor looked over and it was it was, yeah, it was an awful thing to see. Mum had, had dropped um, two week old little girl. Uh, we picked her up, um, popped her on mum's knee, uh, tried strapping her in as best I could with, with the seat belts. Um, and within three or four minutes, it, it happened again. Um, at this point, the only thing I I could think to do was was plead with, with mum and dad to, to just let me have the baby for a couple of minutes, half an hour to an hour, whatever it took so they could get a bit of rest and, and carry on. It was a horrendous thing to see. Are you a dad yourself? I am. I've got um, two little girls, three and five, yeah. OK, so you're a pro at picking up the baby, holding and cuddling. At least you had the experience to know what to do while you were doing it. <laughs> I've, had, I've had lots of experience <laughs> with that. Um, yeah. Andy, I mean, the way you describe it, the fact that that baby dropped to the floor is uh, just an indication of how exhausted, exhausted a mother can be, that she can't even hang on to a tiny newborn baby. I mean, you were dealing with people in utter desperation. And, of course, let's not forget, this particular um, aircraft was being loaded just hours after the suicide attack wasn't it? These people had been through hell and they had just about survived. And then they were getting out. I don't know how many days they had been at the airport, but we saw the scenes of chaos. I mean, just describe the state that these families were in as you loaded them onto these planes. It's really difficult to describe the that seeing people with bandages on their heads, cuts up their arms, um, clear injuries. Uh, the, the, you know, a lot of them had no shoes on. Um, Thousand-yard stairs, it was just just people at their lowest possible ebb, um, using any energy they could just to climb up the ramp, as you can see behind us, was, was a struggle. Uh, it was just really, really difficult to watch. Um, and, and see people. I've never seen anything like it, and I hope they never see that again. And Calvin, Wing Commander Bailey, um, you, you've flown missions yourself, uh, but also you've been in charge of, of many members of the team out there. Uh, have, have your team struggled to deal with what they've seen on the back of this? I mean, just looking at the pictures is, is distressing from when you're sitting in a nice enclosed studio here. I don't know how it must have been for you and everybody else, all the men and women working with you. So there was, um, good morning. Um, 
There was many uh, different emotions that uh, the team felt. The first uh, sort of initial uh, emotions were of um, anxiety when uh, we realised the situation that we were arriving in, which is very unusual for the crews. We're, we're used to dealing with um, uh, sort of contact with the enemy and being able to worry uh, about dealing with being shot at um, and, um, and kind of normal military uh, feelings. What, what we weren't used to was um, the fear, the physical fear of, of aircraft impacting aircraft or aircraft impacting other other vehicles on the ground. Yeah, well, and so that pictures, was actually. the first wave of emotions. I, I've seen pictures of, you know, trying to take Indeed. off. When there are, how, how did you make that decision? Well, is it safe? Isn't it safe? I mean, it's just... In, did you have to land when there were people on the runway as well? So we... Uh, the, uh, the moment the, aircraft, the airport became overrun, we had a number of aircraft in the air. Um, and we saw some um, uh, very cra uh, courageous acts of uh, crews attempting to land on the airfield and having to make um, you know, instantaneous decisions as to whether they were going to expose people on the ground and in the aircraft to a greater amount of risk than was necessary. Um, and that was something uh, that all of the crews had to deal with um, uh, on that day. Andy was one of the crews that was airborne at the time. Um, and the pressure of knowing that people were um, being, uh, that were in harm's way on the ground was something that bore very heavily on their shoulders and also kind of mine as a commander, knowing that um, I was sending people into uh, a situation that, that was difficult for people remote to the operation to conceive. Now, um, in terms of uh, taking off, Sorry. Keep going, keep going. Keep going, please keep going. In, in, terms, in, terms for in terms for taking off from the airfield, you probably heard some of the um, uh, stories over the weekend, Wing Commander Kev Latchman of 99 Squadron um, and some others who had some very near misses with uh, well-meaning individuals that were operating on the airfield surface at Kabul that just weren't able to see or understand the normal airfield operating environment. So all of those things played on the emotions of the crews. Um, but there was also, there was a much more powerful emotion that uh, was kind of overriding. Um, and that was one of humanity and, and of people, I said it would be me, the people um, having to look after people. And uh, as Andy described, we kind of received people onto the back of the um, onto the back of the airframe in waves. The first wave of people, as Andy said, didn't have any shoes because they had been um, standing in the sewers waiting for days. Um, and those people were in reasonably good order apart from their physical being. Um, but as the days progressed, their uh, emotional and physical state uh, deteriorated. And that's not something that's normal for anyone to deal with. And whilst I mean, we have great admiration for the movements personnel and the army, um, folks that were on the ground dealing with this consi uh, consi uh, consistently, um, we were having to cr um, face this in kind of blunt, traumatic blows as, um, you know, people that were reflective of our own families that looked like us, uh, that had children like us, um, had to board our aircraft. And, uh, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the acts of, of kindness and, you know, um, uh, just good human values that, that the crews um, were able to show people on the short amount of time that they were on board our aircraft. You both we embody are, that absolutely right. We are all proud of you too. And don't worry about the fact that you're choked up on the telly, mate. I think it describes very eloquently how even someone who's been serving as long as you was affected and moved by the human triage that you were having to deal with. We're proud and thankful for the work that you have both done. Thank you very much for joining us. Before you go, Ooh. sorry, I, I, I just want to... You are both heroes, and um, there is a campaign now to grant military medals to the British troops involved in that evacuation, and um, we throw our weight behind that because you deserve it. You absolutely deserve it. What you did uh, was just beyond words. You're, you're extraordinary people. Wing Commander Calvin Bailey, people will have seen the way that your compassion shines through, and, and both of you, of course, but the, the way that your emotions come through. But I just want... I was sent your biography, 
And I just want to tell people a little bit about, about you. Unfortunately, Andy, no one sent me yours, but um, <laughs> and so let me just mention Gavin's and then, and then maybe you can tell us. Um, Wing Commander, you were born in Zambia and you were raised in South East London. Your mother is Zambian and your father is English. There was no history in the military. One day you decided to become a pilot and so you became a pilot. So it was unusual for a kid from South East London. You joined the Air Force in 2000 and you got to the front line on September the 11th, 2001. Wow. A year later, you were in Afghanistan. Now, apart from being there, you have also deployed with the Americans during the Haiti earthquake. Uh, you were employed in the Philippines after the typhoon and you were awarded an MBE for being in charge of the RAF's humanitarian and disaster relief efforts. A year later, you were in charge of the Yazidi genocide response and dropped aid to those desperate people on top of a mountain in 2014. You are the Vice Chair of the Armed Forces Chronic Conditions and Disabilities in Defence Network. You're a member of the Black and Minority Ethnic Network, Network and you're a passionate gender advocate. You're a school governor and you mentor people back in South East London as well as within the RAF. And I just want people to know all of that because it strikes me, both of you um, embody heroic values that deserve recognition and reward. And we thank you for your service and for what you've done and we can see the impact that it has had on you. And we just think you're extraordinary Thank you. people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have to say that um, working, uh, we choose to work for the military and uh, be the, the uh, nation's um, insurance policy. It's something that we take um, great privilege in um, and doing something like this when we're asked to uh, is the reward uh, that we uh, seek. Well, we, we thank you. We thank you very much. And I have to say, you know, to, to hear Susanna's biography and to hear an embodiment of heroism and traditional de definitions of masculinity just shows to any young men out there who were scared to show their emotions, real men can cry and there's nothing wrong with it. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> And cuddle babies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're both heroes. Thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you so much.